Hey, everyone. Welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on gaining insight from the world's very best macro minds. I'm your host today, J.D. Durkin. We are here with you today to gain a bit more insight into the issue of federal deficits, really their overall economic influence, as well as overall expectations for inflation. As always, my friends, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews to help keep your portfolio on track and to help you keep up to date with the latest investment news. Joining us here today is Michael Green, Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Michael, thanks for being here. Welcome to public. Oh, thank you very much, JD. It's great to have you here, my friend. Okay, so let's start with it with a look at, at fiscal deficits, something that I think a lot of our, our viewers probably see in the headlines without maybe having all the necessary context. In a recent piece you published over at Substack, you compared the federal deficit as a percentage of GDP to levels during the 08 era, the global financial crisis. Well, talk to me about the risks that you see for this deficit level to the economy. Well, so remember that the federal deficit is simply government spending in excess of taxation, whether that's being collected from individuals, corporations, excise taxes that are being levied on imports that are coming into the country, et cetera, right? We've known for a very long time that the deficit was going to increase. We tie that largely to the growth of things like Social Security, et cetera. But just in the past few years, we've also seen a dramatic expansion of other types of spending, right? But what's really interesting about the deficit, where we're really actually seeing the deficit hit, is it's in a failure to collect taxes. So actually, tax collections are really the key driver that's pushing down or pushing up the deficit at this point in time. And when we think about that from a stimulative standpoint, it becomes a question of, is this a permanent change or is this a temporary change? And the thing that most people seem to be ignoring is that a huge fraction of this is actually coming from the delay in the, in the payment of taxes from the state of California. The state of California was designated a national emergency area due to the wildfires that occurred in 2022. That meant that, the, and the flooding, I'm sorry, that occurred in the spring of 2023, that created conditions under which they don't have to pay California residents and corporations that exist in areas like Silicon Valley, which is one of the affected counties in California, don't have to pay their taxes until October 15th. So normally the tax collections would come in on April 15th. This year they've been deferred to October 15th. That's led to a dramatic decrease in California tax collections. Mm -hmm. California represents between 15 and 20% of total taxes in the United States. And as a result, when California taxes are down 30 plus percent, the natural conclusion is, well, that's going to meaningfully impact the deficit. Mm. The problem is that this is actually going to reverse itself later in the year. So all those taxes are now going to come flowing in on an unseasonal basis. We see this if we look at reports like Google or Facebook, now Meta. They're actually, in the case of Google, they're holding like $9 billion worth of unpaid taxes that they're going to pay as late as they possibly can, probably October 14th, October 15th. So a lot of this dynamic is actually going to reverse itself. Now, there really are areas that you mentioned monetary policy that are actually leading to much higher spending levels than we'd anticipated. The primary driver of that is, of course, the Federal Reserve hiking interest rates. That means that the bill that is being paid on the U.S. government debt is far higher than was originally planned for and budgeted simply because the Fed has hiked rates to levels that we've really never seen before. That's creating its own really interesting dynamics as well, right? Because what we should be doing, and as crazy as it sounds, and as much as people may object to this, we should be raising taxes so that we're recapturing that interest income that is flowing in primarily to the very wealthy in the United States. But because nobody wants to raise taxes, particularly as we approach an election year, we're creating conditions under which bizarrely, the monetary policy that is supposed to be contractionary, that is supposed to lead to reduced levels of economic activity, is putting additional money into the hands of the very wealthy and candidly seniors mm. who've benefited from a combination of factors this year so that their spending is untouched, right? If anything, it's actually growing. We're seeing, a real, we're seeing real evidence that the money that is being made on money market accounts, on savings deposits, CDs, et cetera, is creating a positive stimulus impact. And that's complicating the inflation story, even as it raises risks that a large segment of the corporate sector and the household sector that are very dependent on financing that has relatively long-term aspects to it, right? So things like mortgages mm -hmm. or things like high-yield bonds, 
if companies try to refinance that debt today, or if households were to try to take out a new mortgage, buy a new house today, trading in their 3% mortgage for a 7% mortgage, you'd see a dramatic deterioration in the cash flow characteristics. And so we're in this very strange state of limbo, similar to a wily e. coyote over a ledge, right? Where money is coming into people who already have money, those who are kind of barely getting by, who are borrowing either on credit cards or are unable to afford refinancing their mortgage if they lose their job or they need to relocate for various reasons, mm -hmm. they're a little bit trapped. I think that's leading to a lot of anxiety. We're seeing this in metrics like consumer confidence, which is sure. far weaker than you would expect it to be given the very low levels of unemployment. So, so uh, let me pop in for a sec. So I think for people that, and I, I don't want to needlessly get into the politics of this, but people do see headlines where, you know, to me, the split between like the two major parties right now is that Democrats say we don't tax enough, whereas the solution from more conservative thinkers tends to be uh, we're simply spending too much. G yep. Give us a little bit of a historical perspective. You just did a really good job laying out some of the challenges that I think California uniquely finds itself in in terms of the taxation window for 2023. But this is not a new phenomenon here, Michael, right? That the government spends more than it takes in in taxes. So if we get like, what, what should people know in terms of how this has played itself out over the last few decades to sort of get us to the point where they hear very loud voices in Washington saying that the issue of, of our debt and overall deficit is really at a breaking point. How did we get here? Well, I mean, we got here through a slow accumulation process and then a dramatic accumulation process through COVID, right? So terrible policies around COVID in which we violated all of our known approaches to how to handle infectious disease following the Chinese model of locking down, which candidly um, was just terrible policy all around, whether it came from the Republicans, whether it came from the Democrats is ultimately irrelevant. Everybody participated in it in one form or another. And it created the conditions under which we needed to have a dramatic, dramatic expansion in government debt spending that in turn raised or pulled forward the date at which we're going to face some of the crises associated with those dynamics. But we've known this is going to happen for a long time, as I mentioned before. Social Security, for example, is not actually your money that you've put away to save. It is future generations money that is being paid out today to finance retirees who contributed in the past. Right that was going to grow and accumulate as the baby boomers approached retirement we've made promises that are probably significantly larger than we need to and as a result we're reducing investment associated with the next generation reducing spending on education reducing spending on child care reducing spending on uh, uh, health care for young women who are having children etc we're seeing this manifest itself in reduced fertility rates all of these are areas where we're reducing spending to basically pay money to old people, right? Now, I don't actually want to single out old people as having done something wrong because they didn't. But the simple reality is we failed to realize the levels of productivity that we had anticipated when we made those contractual problem promises, right? That's the core issue that we're facing. It's not so much that it's tax or spend. The answer is obviously both. Right. We need to raise taxes in areas of the economy that are being unfavor or being um, inappropriately favored. Right. We've gone through repeated corporate tax cuts that have actually lowered the tax rate for the highest income Americans to an extraordinary degree. We tried to have a tax reform where we tried to address things like carried interest for private equity, which is simply a giveaway. Right. We couldn't do that because of the political capture that exists within Washington. And so unfortunately, the answer is probably not to raise taxes on middle America as much as it is to increase the distributive dynamics, raise taxes, marginal taxes for higher income Americans, particularly those who generate their income off of corporate income, things like 1031 exchanges, which are tax free refinancings of, of real estate properties and sales of real estate properties. These are all wrinkles within the tax code that the rich get to toss in. And by the way, I, I fully acknowledge that I'm coming from a position of privilege as well, right? So I've benefited from these dynamics as part of the reason why I know them, right? But we're actually looking at a situation where we've just simply given away the candy store in a lot of ways to those who are able to hire the appropriate advisors to get them down that path. So the answer is let's raise taxes in areas in which we're talking about distributing from those who have been very fortunate within the U.S. system. And let's try to actually increase 
some of the spending to benefit those at the lower end, particularly the next generation of Americans who need to become more productive, who need better access to superior education, healthcare, et cetera, so that we can get that productivity we haven't gotten, right? That's really the secret. Sure. I mean, so, I, I, and to your point, I mean, politically speaking, I've never really come across a politician who's going to be successful on the campaign trail by saying, sorry, folks, we actually need to raise taxes against those of you that, that maybe are in higher, uh, higher tax brackets or should be in higher tax brackets. Um, I do have to move on. But, but to, to, to a similar related point, for people who are wondering about the private sector, is the private sector as highly indebted um, to, to what we see with the U.S. government, for instance? What, what does the rest of the U.S. economy look like in terms of a debt structure, for comparison's sake, for the conversation we've already been having? Yeah, no. So, so again, it all boils down to what you choose to spend it on and how you choose to characterize it, right? So a 35-year-old taking on debt to fund the purchase of their first home in which they're going to move in with their wife and child or their husband and child, that actually is good debt, right? That allows them to pull forward and capitalize an expense that they're gonna incur for the rest of their life while creating an asset for themselves, right? Likewise, a business that borrows in order to fund expansion of a factory or to engage in various forms of corporate growth, that can be hugely valuable. But when the debt is largely incurred to pay dividends or to recapitalize a company and reduce the quantity of equity that is in the business in order to fund cash flows out to the sponsors, that's just, you know, shifting pieces of the pie, basically, and enriching some groups versus others. Our real issue, as I would describe it, is just that we don't have a good conversation around what we want to accomplish out of our economy, what we're trying to achieve as compared to just saying, you know, Debt is bad, debt is good. The perverse dynamic in all seriousness that we have is we have an aging population that creates conditions under which there's a shortage of fixed income that guarantees fixed income investment opportunities that guarantee them reasonable return as they look forward to the next 20, 30 years of retirement, right? So what we have unfortunately is an extraordinary, extraordinary degree of financialization where we try to synthetically create that type of debt. You may remember from the movie, The Big Short, the scene with Margot Roby in the bathtub, right? The bubble bath, explaining what a collateralized debt obligation is, right? Yeah. That's a financialization that's trying to create a secure debt stream so that people can secure their retirement. We have that all over the place today, right? And it's creating all sorts of perverse incentives instead of people spending the money in productive ways and being focused on that, we, we're very focused on this dynamic of financialization. And again, I'm a direct beneficiary of it, so I'm speaking against my own interests. Sure. And I think that scene is also probably a lot of people's introduction to like subprime mortgages and what you should think of when you hear the word subprime, right? We all remember that scene. Um, so, so we touched on this in terms of the macro lens a, a bit ago, but of course we know the Fed uh, recently raised uh, another 25 bips. We're looking at uh, five and a quarter to five and a half. What is your take on pushing a, a higher rate of interest in an environment where we already have such high levels of debt? Because we cover the, the Fed component pretty closely in a lot of big business news conversations, but maybe not through the lens of the conversation you and I are yeah. having. So again, the, the challenge becomes using a very broad sweeping tool, the Federal, you know, the, the um, Federal Reserve's interest rate policy affects all aspects of the U.S. economy. It raises the prime rate for most household borrowers. It raises the corporate rate at which money is borrowed. But perversely, because most debt contracts are multi-year in nature, it doesn't really cause an immediate impact. This is the long and variable lags dynamic. When the type of hiking policy that we've experienced where the Federal Reserve has hiked in an unprecedented manner over the last 18 months, raising rates from effectively zero to today, five and a quarter percent, you're actually looking at a situation in which we don't have any idea what those impacts are. It means that corporations that refinance themselves in the very loose monetary policy era of 2020 and 2021 have not yet had to come to grips with a much higher cost of capital as they look forward into 2024 and 2025 The first areas of the economy where we're starting to see that hit are areas like commercial real estate, new um, commercial real estate construction, where commercial loans are often variable rate in nature, tied to the short-term interest rate, creating conditions under which we're seeing extraordinary fragility in the commercial real estate space, 
We've also seen hits to banks, et cetera, with bank failures where that's starting to hit, but the vast majority of corporations have not yet come to grips with a much higher cost of capital. If I look at the high yield sector, for example, companies that have borrowed to do a lot of the refinancings that I was talking about, their current coupon is only about five and a half percent. I mean, they're paying five and a half percent on the debt that they have outstanding today. Mm -hmm. If they were to refinance into the market today, if they were to go to the existing interest rate that's occurring in the secondary market, they'd be looking at something north of nine and my estimates are if they actually did that, their credit quality would deteriorate to the point that their interest rates would be more like 13%. Mm. Almost all the companies are bankrupt under that model. We see this in the commercial real estate space where current estimates for the equity value of real estate in the, in the commercial sector, office buildings in particular, is just totally gone in San Francisco, Chicago, New York City. That, Literally, they're all worth nothing to the equity holders, probably worth about 25% of what their last transaction was. So we just don't know. And you know, when we look at the positive impact of the interest rates, it means that companies that are flush with cash, like Google, like Amazon, like Microsoft, et cetera, they're mm -hmm. actually seeing their cash generate a much higher return. That's camouflaging the stress this is gonna cause elsewhere in the economy. And it's what I would describe as fragility. Right. We're just in a situation in which we don't actually know what's going to happen over the next 12 months. But almost all models suggest that we're in a very brittle condition that's, you know, Hemingway has the famous line. How did you go bankrupt slowly and then all at once? That all at once is actually approaching. Sure. Uh, let's shift uh, with our remaining minutes here to inflation. Obviously, we'll get a fresh CPI print later in the week. How can this current high debt environment impact Overall inflation trends, is especially remembering the fact that we know the central bank is as data dependent as it says it is. Well, unfortunately, again, the data that they're following is primarily very lagging in nature. So the construction of CPI actually plays in dramatically to this type of influence. If I look at things like producer price indices that don't have many of the same adjustments that we have within the CPI or the PCE, the personal consumption uh, expenditures index, which is really what the Fed follows, if I look at the comparison between those two, PPI has actually been negative, right? We've been in deflation for producer prices, primarily due to the retreat of oil. The reason why CPI has remained high is because of the housing segment of it, the owner's equivalent rent and the rent of shelter, which is a very slow moving index by construction. Many people will remember saying the Fed is crazy or the BLS is lying to us about inflation in the fall of 2021 when realized inflation numbers were running much greater and the actual reported inflation numbers were low, that was because 40% of the index is tied to this super slow moving dynamic. The San Francisco Federal Reserve, the local branch within San Francisco actually just came out with an analysis that says, by next year, we'll be looking at deflation in the housing sector, mm -hmm. right? So this incredible lagging dynamic we're going from currently in the last quarter, the last report, we had housing inflation of almost 8% annualized. That's going to zero. That's 40% of the index. So we're looking at really deflationary conditions. But over the very short term, now we've seen the energy components start to stabilize. We're starting to see the result of cuts in terms of production coming from OPEC and other producers. Uh, the negative, the impact of the fall in oil prices in the United States has led to less robust production than we might have otherwise expected. And all of that is creating an interesting cocktail where that Fed's data dependency that they're looking at effectively what happened in the rearview mirror means we could get really bad policy choices. I think we actually are experiencing those really bad policy choices, but we'll only wake up to that once it becomes a reality late in 2023, early in 2024. Sure. So, so, so to the point about the Fed, uh, any quick thoughts you have overall on the real estate sector as well as its future price momentum? Uh, and I asked that because Chair Powell recently stated he believed home prices had recently reached their peak, which reminds me of this other component with regards to real estate. Well, you, I, I think you said trough. I think you mean that there was the, uh, uh, yes. they had troughed, not peaked. In other words, that they were starting to stabilize and head upwards. Look, I, I just think that that's a, a terrible mistake. So part of what is happening there is just that we have people trapped in their mortgages, right? They can't afford their house at current mortgage rates, but they can afford their existing mortgages. That means that people that want to retire and buy a home in Florida, for example, 
are looking at a dramatic increase in cost if they were to do so. So they're stuck in place. They can't put that market, that house onto the market. That again is creating these very fragile situations where if we begin to see an increase or an uptick in job loss, suddenly people are forced to actually engage in these transactions that can occur at much lower prices. And the one thing that has really held up the economy in terms of the, the housing market has actually been the new home market because there's been such a shortage of homes available for sale on the existing side. We're down somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four million homes versus what we would expect to be sold on the existing side. That's creating an opening for the new homes. Those new homes are being made more attractive through what's called teaser rates. You may remember these from the period of 2005, 2006. The problem is, is that there's an assumption that you can refinance into lower rates when it comes but if home prices fall, then you can't refinance, mm -hmm. right? And so we're recreating some of the conditions from 2007, 2008 as we speak. Absolutely. Um, finally, wait, I got distracted. You got a dog or a cat dog, over your shoulder? Dog checking out the door. Listen, your research assisting. Your dog's welcome on the show anytime. Um, or finally, are you in the camp of a recession due to a highly in debt economy? Are you in the soft landing camp? What's your current thinking? Well, I, th I think, unfortunately, it remains to be determined. I think the biggest thing that is keeping the unemployment level so low is that we have very low growth of the labor force. That's just a demographic factor tied to the retirement of baby boomers and a slowing flow of millennials coming into the labor force. Very different characteristic than we had in 2006, 2007, when the millennials were just starting to really make their way into the employment market, contributing to a much higher level of unemployment. So I think this is going to be a tricky one to diagnose. But I also think that like, if I look at this characterization of no landing, soft landing, hard landing, I lean much more towards the hard landing simply because the longer we wait to actually begin addressing the risks that exist on this refinancing wall that approaches in 2024 and 2025, the bigger the risk is that those changes are forced upon us. And perversely, all the beneficial dynamics that we were talking about in terms of higher income flowing to those who have cash in the bank those disappear the minute the Fed starts cutting rates. And it doesn't actually reverse the process of financial distress once that's begun. So I, I think we're headed towards a hard landing and I would expect that that begins to manifest itself later this year. But again, it, like this is a very tricky period, right? We just haven't seen a lot of these dynamics play out before. Absolutely. All right, my special thanks there to our guest for the show, Michael Green, Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Michael, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me and my dog. <laughs> yeah, you and the dog are welcome back anytime. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.